Okay, welcome to today's colloquium. Um, I'm Blaine Heckel, department chair, and I've been asked to welcome you and provide a few opening remarks. In recent years, after the Nobel Prize in Physics has been announced, we've tried to have colloquia that focused on the physics of the Nobel Prize. And this year, it's particularly, particularly appropriate given the large contributions that, that the department has made to both experiments that were credited by the Nobel Committee with the, the discovery of neutrino oscillations. Neutrino oscillations are strange. Once a neutrino is produced, it can no longer decide whether it's an electron neutrino, a muon neutrino, or a tau neutrino. So it propagate through space is a linear superposition of three mass eigenstates, which I find very strange. Um, we still don't know what those mass eigenstates are, but we have people in the department working on that problem. Professor Jeffrey Wilkes and the late Kenneth Young, plus students and postdocs, were members of the Super K collaboration. They provided the essential GPS timing system, electronics, and hardware for the outer vessel veto system. And we'll hear from Professor Wilkes today. Uh, the team of Hamish Robertson, Peter Doe, John Wilkerson, Nikolai Tolich, and Jason Detweiler, plus SEMPA staff and students, postdocs, uh, they formed the, the lead US effort on the SNOW experiment, the Sudbury Neutrino Oscillation Experiment. Uh, we were the lead US institution, providing large pieces of hardware, electronics, software, and analysis to that project. Uh, that snow project has a big UW stamp on it. And it is gratifying that all the efforts of the, part of the department have been acknowledged by the Nobel Committee as being research of appropriate quality and significance to be deserving of a Nobel Prize. Uh, let me end by saying that after today's colloquium, there will be a reception outside and everybody is welcome to, to join us. With that, I will call upon our first speaker, which is, who is Nikolai Kauch? Okay, so um, I'm going to give an introduction to uh, neutrinos before we hear the details of the. <laughs> yeah. You don't hear anything. <laughs> Let's try again. Okay, so before we hear about the results from the Super Camille Kande experiment from Jeff Wilkes and then the Snow experiment from Hamish and a summary from Jason following that. So, uh, at the beginning part of the last century, what was our understanding of uh, radioactive beta decay? Uh, they first of all observed uh, charged particles, in particular electrons, uh, coming out from these uh, atoms or nuclei. They weren't so sure what was going on, soon afterwards, they discovered that in this process of emitting an electron, a neutron inside of this nucleus was turned into a proton, emitting the electron as well in the process. And this is what they understood. But there was a big problem. And the big problem was, if we understood our basic mechanics, uh, we have a nucleus turning into a different nucleus, emitting an electron. There should be conservation of energy and momentum. Those electrons should be coming out with a single energy. Okay? And when they looked at the energy of those electrons, they saw a continuous spectrum. And at the time, and this, amongst other uh, pieces of evidence, suggested that maybe something more was going on. Okay, one of the desperate remedies that they came up with was perhaps a neutrino was being produced. So a neutrino would have to be taking away some of the extra energy of momentum, so we can still preserve our understanding that the nuclear decays preserve energy of momentum. And so this is the energy of the electron. The rest of the energy would be taken away by the neutrino. Soon afterwards, 
the neutrino was discovered, for which a Nobel Prize was awarded. And then a second neutrino was discovered, for which another Nobel Prize was awarded. <laughs> and then finally, a third neutrino was discovered, for which a Nobel Prize is currently not being awarded. <laughs> We can know that there are three light neutrinos based on accelerator experiments. And in these experiments, the rate of the reactions that we see uh, depends on the number of neutrinos. If we saw two neutrinos, we would expect a cross-section like this. Four neutrinos would expect a cross-section like this. And three neutrinos would expect a cross-section like this. And the three neutrino model fits almost perfectly with the data they observe. In fact, when we do a fit to this, we see that the accelerator data suggests that there's actually 2.984 plus or minus 0.08 light neutrino flavors. Okay? So we know very precisely that there's essentially three neutrinos. We've seen three neutrinos, so we seem to have a very nice model. Each of these neutrinos are associated with a different charged particle. The neutrino in the original beta decay experiments is called the uh, electron neutrino. If a muon were produced instead of an electron, it would be a muon neutrino. And if a tau were produced instead of a muon, it would be a tau neutrino. So those are what we call the flavor eigenstates. Another interesting property about the neutrinos is when we look at their handedness, there only appears to be so-called left-handed neutrinos. So if a neutrino is propagating to the right, it is spinning around like that. It looks like your thumb pointing in the direction of travel, your fingers curling in the direction of spin, uh, a left hand. We've never seen a right-handed neutrino where the spin is in the same direction, but the direction of travel is now reversed. Okay, this hasn't been observed in nature. And when we turn to the antiparticle, the antineutrino, we get the opposite uh, handedness. Okay, so we have these two exist in nature, and these two don't exist in nature, as far as we know. And this is important, because when they were developing the standard model of neutrino physics, or standard model of physics, this particular property suggested to them that the neutrinos must be massless. So a Nobel Prize was awarded recently for the discovery of the Higgs boson. And the other particles get their mass through the interaction with the Higgs field. We have a left-handed electron interacts with the Higgs field, turns into a right-handed electron. The amount of this interaction determines their mass. If the neutrinos are all left-handed, they can't turn into a right-handed flavor. There must be no interaction with the Higgs field. They must not have a mass. So the standard model has massless neutrinos in it. So that's what we know about neutrinos. But what we're going to find out is perhaps neutrinos do have mass. Okay? So how can we measure the mass of these neutrinos, which we know would have to be extremely small, given that we've never seen these uh, right-handed neutrinos? So one way we can do it is by looking for oscillations. So the way I like to talk about neutrino oscillations is if a neutrino has a definite mass that propagates through space, with a particular frequency, and it maintains that frequency forever. Okay, so this is like a couple pendulum. We put the two pendulums apart like this. They continue to oscillate in this mode uh, forever. We could take another mode of our couple pendulum, bring both pendulums to the side. They will continue to oscillate <coughs> like this forever. So this can be considered one mass neutrino. This can be considered another mass neutrino. They both have their own particular frequency, and those frequencies are not necessarily the same. Okay, so in the case of neutrinos, the frequency depends on the mass. So those are the mass states of the neutrino. What are the flavor states? In this analogy, the flavor state is equivalent to one of the pendulum. So we call this pendulum the electron uh, pendulum, and this one the muon pendulum. If we start off with just one of them pulled off, it starts oscillating. But pretty soon, it stops oscillating, and the other one starts oscillating. Because this is a superposition of those two different mass states, both pulled off to the left, and one pulled off to the left, one pulled off to the right. If you add those states together, it's like one of them wasn't pulled off, and the other one was pulled off to the left over. Okay? That was the initial state. And they both start moving with different frequencies, and you eventually end up with a state with the other one moving, <coughs> and the first one not. So that's essentially what's going on with neutrino oscillations. So if we have neutrinos have particular mass eigenstates and particular frequencies, but we observe them through neutrino flavors, we may see the change in one flavor to another. And that would prove for sure that the neutrinos have to have mass. Now, I have introduced this as if this was obvious. This is by no means obvious to anyone. <laughs> so uh, what Jeff is going to get up to and talk to you about next is the first indication that there was a strange behavior of neutrino oscillations actually occurring. 
So uh, at this stage, Jeff Wilkes can get up and uh, talk about Supercamp. Okay, thank you very much. Thanks very much. Thanks, Nikolai, for uh, warming up the audience. <laughs> um, so, uh, I think you have heard that uh, the experiments we're describing involve big tanks of water in mines underground. And you, the immediate question is, why on earth would you do that? Why do we, who would want to put a big tank of water deep in the earth? Uh, the origins come from back in the 1980s when grand unified theories or guts uh, we're estimating that the proton might have a lifetime of around 10 to the 30th years. Uh, protons are absolutely stable uh, uh, in the old standard model, but uh, these ideas of unification needed to be tested. And so you have a choice. You can uh, put a proton on a pedestal and watch it for 10 to the 20th times the age of the universe, or you can collect 10 to the 30th protons and watch them for several years. Uh, why water? Well, water is a substance that physicists can afford in large quantities. <laughs> a thousand tons of water turns out to be about the right number of protons and neutrons according to the predictions at that time. Proton decay, of course, produces relativistic charged particles, and uh, these produce what's called Cherenkov radiation, and I'll, I'll describe how that works in a little bit. Uh, the picture shows that uh, you know proton might decay, for example, into a positron, an anti-electron, and a pi zero particle, and then these in turn decay. Uh, in the case of the uh, positron, it would be traveling uh, at a very high speed and would produce Cherenkov radiation. So, you take your tank of water, which serves as a, a giant ball of blob of protons and neutrons, and you line it with photomultiplier tubes. These are devices that detect single photons with good probability and measure their time to on the order of one nanosecond. And you observe the Cherenkov light this way. But the problem is that uh, if you don't do anything else, cosmic rays from uh, outer space will overwhelm your detector. Uh, and if you are in a mine to filter out the cosmic rays, then you have radioactive minerals all around you and plenty of radon, radioactive uh, radon gas in the air. So you go underground to filter the cosmic rays, but you also need to be careful about your water, uh, highly purified to uh, reduce the backgrounds. And two collaborations that I'll talk about uh, worked on this in the 1980s, the uh, one in the USA, the IMB group, and the uh, Kamio Kande group in Japan, which was the immediate predecessor of super Kamio Kande. Uh, so this stood for Kamioka Nucleon Decay Experiment, a water tank. It's actually on the order of 15 meters across, but uh, 10 meters of, act of useful area with 1,000 tons of water. But the problem was the original Kamiokande experiment uh, could not detect neutrinos with energies in the range of solar neutrino energies. Uh, it had a 20 million, million electron volt or so threshold, which is fine for proton decay. Uh, but not you can't see solar neutrinos, as Hamish will expand on. So. Uh, after a few years and after the theorists revised their lifetime estimates upward, it became clear that Kamio Kande was not going to see a new uh, proton decay. And in the best tradition of turning lemons into lemonade, it became a nu neutrino detector experiment. So now the N in Kamio Kande stands for neutrino. <laughs> uh, this also shows a picture of one of my uh, colleagues swimming in the IMB detector in the US. So they accomplished a great deal. Uh, first of all, they set limits on proton decay, nucleon decay, grand unified theories. Uh, they also, unlike prior uh, neutrino detectors, solar neutrino detectors, they could give information about the direction a neutrino was coming from, being visual detectors, so to speak, op optical detectors. And so they were able to first conclusively prove that neutrinos are in fact coming from the sun, but as we will see, not enough of them were. I mean, there's what's called the solar neutrino puzzle, 
we think we've known uh, how the sun works uh, since Hans Bethe worked this out in the 1940s. Uh, Professor Bethe was a regular visitor to our department, another connection. Uh, and uh, even though models of the sun have been refined, still to the best of our ability there were, uh, of calculation, there were just not enough neutrinos detected from the sun. So uh, worse than that, uh, they added a new puzzle called the atmospheric neutrino puzzle. Uh, so the conclusion was that in order to resolve the atmospheric neutrino puzzle and also the solar neutrino puzzle, uh, a bigger detector was needed. But uh, in 1987, they had uh, a lot of publicity and interest in these experiments because uh, in our nearest neighbor galaxy, the Large Magellanic Cloud, a, a star seen on the left decided to go supernova, seen on the right, thereby increasing its luminosity by a huge amount, and also, as part of that process, emitting a huge number of neutrinos. And both IMB and Super, uh, pardon me, Cameo Conde detected neutrinos, uh, uh, an unstatistical burst of neutrinos in time with the expected arrival uh, of information from the supernova. So that was a success, and it uh, allowed uh, the experiments to get the kind of support that would be needed. And uh, Masato Koshiba uh, at the University of Tokyo uh, Institute for Cosmic Ray Research was the leader of the Kamiokande experiment. And he led the effort to design Super-K and get the necessary support uh, for this you know, hundreds of millions of dollars, 1990s dollars, uh, project in Japan. Uh, and he was uh, cited by the Nobel Committee in uh, 2002, along with Ray Davis, another pioneer who will be described in later talks, uh, for their uh, contributions to neutrino astrophysics. But uh, Koshiba Sensei's uh, leadership made Super-K Possible. So Super-K, where is it? It's located in the Japanese Alps, as they're called. Nagano is where we had a, a Winter Olympics some decades ago. Uh, there's a town uh, of several million people. It's called Toyama on the uh, Japan Sea coast. And uh, Super-K is about 40 kilometers south in the mountains in a mine belonging to the Kamioka Mining and Smelting Company, which is where the name Kamiokande comes from. Uh, same mine as Kamiokande, a new pit. And Super-K will detect both natural, that is to say solar, atmospheric, and astrophysical uh, neutrinos, as well as artificial neutrinos, because right now, for the past, since 2009 anyway, we've been sending a high-intensity neutrino beam from a proton accelerator on the Pacific coast of Japan through the Earth 300 kilometers to Super-K, uh, where we detect the particles and look at flavor changes. The beam is produced as a pure muon neutrino beam, so we can immediately uh, check whether uh, they all get there or not. Uh, currently, I actually don't have any students working solely on Super-K. My most recent PhD students did their theses on T-K. Here's Super Kamiokande. US-Japan collaboration of, at the time, uh, 1990s, it was about 130 people. It's in the middle of a mountain. This is a nice mine. I would hate to have to work at the mine that Hamish is going to describe, where you have to <laughs> descend deep into the bowels of the earth in elevators. Here you just drive your car straight into the mountain. And in the center of the mountain, you have 1,000 meters of rock in all directions for filtering cosmic ray particles. The tank contains 50,000 tons of water. Uh, Kamio Kande had 1,000 phototubes. This one has 11,000 of these phototubes. They're about 20 inches across, about this big. Uh, there's also an outer detector to check for, uh, for uh, charged particles coming in. This allows you to veto things caused by, events caused by radioactivity from surrounding rock. We began operation in April 96 and published the first evidence for neutrino mass in two, a couple of years later. Typically we trigger, that's, I should not say record, it's trigger about 15 times per second, uh, then the huge software uh, program filters this down to about 10 neutrino events per day that are actually recorded. And there's Super-K. 
This shows uh, in 1996, some of our happy graduate students uh, paddling around wiping off the photo tubes as the water level, super purified water, notice how clear the water is, rises. And of course, everybody wants to get into the act and there's uh, <laughs> another uh, boatman, Super K boatman. Uh, Cherenkov light, what does it mean? The neutrino comes in, oops, somehow <laughs> got shifted between the back and here, sorry. Neutrino comes in and it produces a muon by interacting in a nucleus, let's say, in the water. Well, the muon is relativistic. It's traveling at almost the speed of light in a vacuum, C. But in water, as every optics class learns, uh, the speed of propagation of light is only three-fourths that of speed in a vacuum. So the muon is actually pulling, carrying its charge along faster than the electromagnetic field it creates can follow and it produces a shockwave. It's, it's analogous to what happens when a jet plane goes faster than the speed of sound and air, and this sound propagation turns into a shockwave. This is important because you produce characteristic uh, angle. Light is, Cherenkov light is produced at a characteristic angle uh, determined by the index of refraction. So you can see rings of light on the walls of the, of the water tank. Uh, now from them, you can deduce lots of things, such as where the particle was produced, what direction it was going, and so on. And what we see is the Cherenkov rings produced are sharp uh, for muon, uh, muons produced by muon-flavored neutrinos, and fuzzy for electrons produced by electron-flavored neutrino interactions. And so here's what you see. This is an event display. Imagine the super-K detector is a soup can uh, open up the lids and flat, fold them back, uh, slit the side and flatten it. Now you're looking at the inside of the suit can. Each dot is a photomultiplier tube, and the color represents how many photons, what, how, what intensity of light it recorded. We can identify an electron neutrino event by its fuzziness, and a muon neutrino by its sharpness. And we know these are neutrinos because the outer detector uh, contains nothing. Nothing, no charged particle came in from outside. And the only thing that can produce a charged particle, only neutral particle that can do this kind of trick is the neutrino. What are atmospheric neutrinos? Well, they're produced by cosmic rays. Cosmic rays are belched out by uh, supernovae in our galaxy, and they wander the galaxy for millions of years, and then suddenly run into an unpleasant surprise when they hit the Earth's atmosphere and are smashing into an air nucleus. These produce particles called mesons, which in turn decay to muons and neutrinos. And without going into detail, on average, we expect two muon-flavored neutrino particles to be produced for every electron-flavored neutrino particle when all is taken into account. Uh, I, I really am touched by my colleague Kajita san uh, thanked the neutrinos for the Nobel Prize and also thought to thank the cosmic rays. I've been in cosmic rays for 40 years, and, and uh, they need some thanks. So uh, what's the atmospheric neutrino puzzle? What we find is too few muon neutrinos in detectors that are <coughs> summing up their data from all directions. What Super-K was able to show is that neutrinos that are coming downward, having traveled about 15 kilometers from their production point, therefore having lived about tens of, a few tens of microseconds, uh, are arrived in the correct expected numbers, but neutrinos that are produced on the other side of the Earth, down by the Falkland Islands, uh, travel 13,000 kilometers. They have a thousand times longer existence between production and absorption, and they have time to do stuff like oscillate. So how do you do that? This is a, I, I'm just going to go into one bit of detail. This is a classic example of how science works. Uh, we uh, need to avoid making uh, deeply embarrassing announcements of incorrect results. So we divided the analysis group. The other people in the experiment were looking for proton decay and were looking for solar neutrinos, but those of us, including our UW team, that were doing uh, atmospheric analysis uh, joined, divided into two groups in the US and Japan, and then analyzed the data and checked our, our, our results the same within uncertainties. Then we present the results in full collaboration, and then somebody has to stand up and present this to the world and take whatever rocks might be thrown, and Borkajita-san was selected for that role. 
Uh, and here's the paper we produced a little bit later, and here's the UW contingent. This is alphabetical by institution, so we're at the end. I won't go into much detail about the distributions. Let me just show you the results. Basically, the blue is what you expect if neutrinos have no mass. The red is what you expect if neutrinos have mass in the quantity we believe uh, the results show. And what you see is the electron neutrino data uh, is uh, hunky-dory with the blue expectation. So are the downward going muon neutrinos, but there's big uh, deviations, big shortages of upward going uh, muon neutrinos. And here's the results uh, plotted in terms of the, chain, uh, the difference in mass squared that Nikolai just mentioned. Now, you can't measure the mass directly. We can only determine that there must be masses, massive states and that the difference between two of these states squared is on the order of 2 10 to the minus 3 EV squared. This was the first conclusive and widely accepted evidence that neutrinos have mass, and it produced moments of fame. Uh, I was even called and interviewed by the Scotsman of Edinburgh. So that's my media <laughs> moment of fame. <laughs> And uh, Bill Clinton, uh, whenever you say Clinton now, it seems to be Hillary, but this was Bill. Uh, you mentioned it at uh, the MIT commencement. So uh, here are some of the UK, uh, UW Super K people. Uh, first, my dear friend and colleague and research partner, Ken Young, who unfortunately died only a few months after the results were announced. Uh, and then here are some of the graduate students who worked on the experiment, Jeff George, uh, now the Aerospace Corporation after a postdoc at Caltech. Eric Thrain uh, also went to Caltech and then moved on to a faculty position at Monash University in Australia. Andy Stakira was at MIT Lincoln Labs and is now in a genome research company. Hans Behrens was the guy who made everything work. And uh, in fact, he disciplined the detector. When the detector broke down, we would but all we'd have to do is telephone Hans and it would start working again. So there's the things <laughs> happening. Christine Washburn, who's now a uh, department chair at uh, Everett College, uh, worked on the project. Um, other people, Vladi Chalupka, helped us with construction. Larry Wine, Ross Doyle, uh, Yoshi Araishi, and Mike Zamba were my PhD students. Uh, Shima Shimoji and uh, Paul Stefano were my uh, uh, MS students. So uh, I also don't want to end without extending my thanks to the uh, master machinists of our department, physics department, instrument shop, who built bits and pieces that we need as well as crucial elements for the snow experiment. Okay, thank you. Jeff, uh, great, great introduction. It's, uh, we start off with this uh, picture uh, before I talk about the snow experiment. And uh, what is it that we're looking at here? So you're looking down the neck of another large tank of water, this time not in Japan, but in Canada. And this, uh, the neck of this vessel is one and a half meters in diameter. It's made of acrylic. You're looking straight down through 15 meters, roughly, of ultra-pure heavy water. You can hardly tell there's any water there. And these are the photomultipliers right at the bottom of the acrylic vessel, just a small fraction of the total almost 1,000 <laughs> photomultipliers that are down there. This, um, these long uh, tubes here, they don't look so long, they're actually 11 meters in length. Uh, these are the neutron counters that were made here in, at the University of Washington. See four of the strings here. There's a total of 30, well, another 36 outside, a total of 40 that you can't see because they're going, they're behind the, uh, the, the neck of the vessel. You can see the wires going off down to those uh, other uh, detectors. And this uh, device here is a remotely operated submersible vehicle that was developed by Peter Doe to install these detectors here. And so the detectors were installed after the first experiments were done in snow with only pure heavy water. And with these detectors, we were then able to detect the neutral current part of the reaction. So 
So this is just by way of explanation of what that picture is, if you're curious. But our story actually begins uh, quite a bit earlier. We have to go back for, for a minute to uh, 1968. And uh, Ray Davis, uh, who actually won the Nobel Prize in, in uh, chemistry in, in 2002, uh, was uh, chemistry. Physics. 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 It was physics. Um, sure. This is a, a, a tank of perchlorethylene in the Homestake gold mine uh, at the depth of around 4,800 feet. And Ray uh, realized that uh, it would be really nice to see if neutrinos were coming from the sun because that was predicted as a uh, byproduct of the sun's uh, producing energy. And he said, well, if that's the way the sun works, we ought to be able to see those guys. Let's look for them. He realized that if you could uh, see uh, or extract a few atoms of argon produced by neutrinos interacting with uh, perchlorethylene, uh, then you would be able to uh, deduce how many neutrinos were coming from the sun. And, and here he is uh, working the, uh, or cooling down the proportional counters that were used to detect that argon 37. So Ray worked um, a man of incredible patience uh, for more than 30 years, counting the very few neutrinos that, uh, that came from uh, interactions of uh, solar neutrinos and perchlorethylene, counting the, the, the argon-37 atoms. And the average rate, however, after that time, was really quite well determined. And it uh, did not agree with the predictions of the standard solar model, largely uh, produced by John McCall. So for many years, it was thought that this was really just a problem with the standard solar models. However, by the mid, I guess, by the end of 1980, the 80s, it was starting to look like that explanation might not really fill the bill. Uh, for one thing, the Cameo Panda experiment that Jeff described uh, also, as he said, saw neutrinos from the sun. Uh, this time, not by chlorine, but by scattering, just like billiard ball collisions from electrons. And that didn't quite agree uh, with uh, the results of uh, Herb. 1985, Herb Chen, who was a professor at Irvine, uh, had, a, I think, what, what you have to agree is a grand idea. He realized that the problem uh, with deciding what was going on with the sun had to do with the fact that if neutrinos had turned into some other flavor of neutrino, then you would never see them with any of the detectors that had been built up to that point. He said, what you need, an experiment which directly addresses the solar neutrino problem, why are there too few, should be sensitive to all species equally. So this was a great idea, and he knew how to do this. He immediately realized that if you had deuterium, heavy water, then deuterium was an excellent uh, target for, for, uh, for setting this reaction, because there is a, a process where neutrinos can interact with deuterium, and it's simply, if you know what a deuteron is, it's a proton and a neutron, it simply breaks them apart, the neutron goes off free, and you can detect that neutron if the backgrounds are really, really low. And that doesn't care what kind of a neutrino wants. It happens with any active neutrino, electron, mu, tau. The sun only makes electron neutrinos. So if you see other kinds of neutrino coming from the sun, as he argued, then you would have proof that neutrinos were oscillating. They were turning into some other flavor. And that means they have mass. Well, sadly, uh, Herb uh, died in, in, in 1987 of leukemia. He was only uh, 44. But his, his grand idea uh, turned into a reality, which we're, uh, we're talking about today. And it, it, it was a really good idea. So this is the Sudbury Neutrino Observatory which resulted from, from this uh, suggestion. It's a big tank of 1,000 tons of heavy water. And I'll tell you in a minute where that came from. Uh, this is in, in Sudbury, Ontario, in a nickel mine, active nickel mine. Uh, with, uh, it's at this depth of around uh, a mile, a little over a mile and a quarter below hard rock. So there's uh, 1,000 tons of heavy water in the Sikulik vessel. Peter Doe also had a lot to do with um, the engineering and quality control of this acrylic vessel. Uh, the heavy water is extremely valuable. It's uh, worth $300 million. So uh, we had to 
made Peter promise to give it back. <laughs> or, or pay for it. The uh, support structure around the outside, just as in Cameo Canada and Super K, are there photomultipliers that look in with the flashes of light produced by Cherenkov light. And uh, the coverage uh, to catch photons was about 60%. The acrylic vessel diameter is 12 meters. Uh, it's hard to get a picture of it, which gives a, an impression of that scale. Then uh, inside, um, both inside the photo tubes and outside in this cavity, is a lot of light water, very pure light water, just to mainly support the uh, vessel and also to uh, stop uh, radioactive uh, interactions, uh, radioactive decays in the rock from simulating neutrino interactions. This is some pictures of the, uh, of the vessel while it was being built. There you can see uh, uh, the uh, vessel is there, and this geodesic, which was actually built by our Berkeley colleagues, uh, holds the photomultipliers, which we bought well, when we were at Los Alamos and supplied for snow. 10,000 photomultipliers, there's the finished vessel. And there's a picture of what they call snowflakes, uh, just an arrangement of, uh, of photomultipliers. I like this picture because uh, it reminds me that uh, the entire success of this experiment depended crucially on uh, a number of people in high places saying yes when it would have been much easier to say no. Uh, th this is the number nine shaft of the Inco nickel mine as it was then. And the, uh, it's now called the Vale, uh, V-A-L-E uh, company, but it's, uh, it's the same uh, shaft that leads down a mile and a half underground. And 16% uh, of the world's nickel comes out of that, sh that single shaft. So this is a busy place. And the fact that they agreed to let us go down there and build a cavern for us what was uh, it, still uh, just amazing. This is heavy water arriving uh, from the Bruce plant. It's a tanker truck. There were 62 truckloads of this ultra pure heavy water brought in from the Canadian um, uh, Ontario Hydro and Atomic Energy of Canada plant. In in Bruce. They use heavy water as a moderator for their power reactors in Canada. So again, they, they let us use $300 million worth of, uh, oh, it was Art McDonald calling. What do you want, Art? Better answer. He wants me to go back to work and stop. Put him on, put him on. There he goes. <laughs> He's a great guy, but he really is a taskmaster. <laughs> so here's the, the secret that, that Herb Chen realized you could uh, use heavy water for. Um, there, is, uh, uh, there are several reactions here. The neutrino interacts with the deuteron and can, break, uh, can turn the, the neutron in the deuteron into a proton, and it comes out as an electron. This only happens for the electron neutrinos. That's the kind of neutrino the sun is supposed to make. Neutral current process, which is the one that Herb uh, really uh, glommed onto as being the key. Here, any kind of neutrino can come in, break up the deuteron into its proton and neutron. The neutrino leaves, but it's left some energy behind, and it's left a free neutron, and you can detect the neutron. Uh, and we actually had three different ways to detect the neutron. And here's a, another reaction, which uh, is the elastic scattering reaction. This works in heavy water or any kind of water, and it's what uh, 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 Jeff uh, described it was seen in Camland and Super K as well, and we can certainly see that in snow. So after taking data, um, this was the 2001 result that um, came from our first analysis. And let me explain what this is. So we do not yet have that neutral current sensitivity. Their first measurements were done with a high threshold. We couldn't see the neutrons. But we could see, we, we could easily see the charge current result, and that's this gray vertical line here. And we could also use the result from Super K, where they had uh, looked at the uh, elastic scattering. Elastic scattering does have a little bit of sensitivity to other kinds of neutrino. So if you, if you can draw a straight line, which looks like this, it equals the electron part plus a little bit from the other part. And that's this slightly tilted line. If there had only been electron neutrinos, these two lines would be in the same place where that arrow is. 
So the fact that they're not in the same place, but they meet up here, was a jaw-dropping moment for us. Because what it says is that, subject to the possible statistical variations, which were about three and a half, four sigma, that there were actually twice as many other flavors, you or tau neutrinos, you couldn't tell which, but one or the other, coming from the sun, as there were electron flavored neutrinos. And this could only happen if you have oscillations. Now these lines here tell you what we would see if we saw if we were able to measure the neutral current flux directly. The dotted line is the standard, it, it's a band, the standard solar model prediction for the total number of neutrinos. Now these are John Batal's old calculations. See how well it agrees there with this uh, frosting. Just wonderful uh, to see that. And then uh, this is the super K uh, snow. If we, if we just take this uh, ellipse and turn it into a a line to predict what we would see, and it's the solid lines. All right, so there is uh, the first paper published. So you can't read it, of course, but I just want to give you the impression of the large number of uh, UW scientists and engineers that, that made that uh, result possible. Uh, and this is by no means the total number. This is uh, a group that continued to be lively, and, and, and even today we have uh, um, a student uh, here at Tim Winchester working on, on an analysis of snow data. We, we had, as I mentioned, three different ways to measure. Um, I better, better hurry up, right, Jason? I'm getting close. Okay. So this is the neutral current detector, neutral current detection array that we built and installed. I just described it at the beginning. These 40 strings of helium three counters that could detect the neutrons resulting from the neutral current interaction. Here they are, ready to be installed underground. A uh, total of 400 meters of helium-3, which in those days we got for $15,000 this big bottle from Los Alamos. Today it's worth probably several million dollars worth of helium-3. Again, somebody said yes. Here is the, the new result. Uh, this is actually after the SALT data. We, we Following the helium-3 work, we didn't plot the data this way. We analyzed it a different way. But you can see here that the um, the band now, this is actual measurement uh, from snow, perfect uh, agreement here. The dotted lines again are the solar model prediction. It's the pure charge current for electron neutrino flavors. The darker part is super K and the wider part is our own measurement. We don't have the size that super K does to, to measure. Uh, we don't have that many electrons. But they all agree very nicely and uh, show that there is uh, twice as many other flavors of neutrinos coming from the sun as electron flavors, and that shows that neutrinos have oscillated. So there's a couple of happy guys, uh, and uh, let's see where I am. So I, I wanted to tell you a little bit what, what it's like to work for art. You already have an idea. <laughs> but uh, in fact, uh, just the day before yesterday, a letter arrived. Uh, I got copied on an email from Alan Poon, who was a student, actually was a student of mine, and Chris Walthams at UBC. And he got a congratula congratulations letter from the, the Catron collaboration, and he copied it, uh, me on his response. He says, uh, dear Christian Guido and colleagues, thank you very much for the kind words. I am honored to be a member of the Snow Collaboration. Art is a great man and truly deserves the prize. I've learned a lot and have become a better human being from collaborating with them over the last few decades. His humility and kindness are contagious. No one could have said it better than that, so I thought I would show that to you. So I think at this point, I will turn it over to, to Jason and uh, let him explain the implications of all this. I sure don't know what we are. correct me beyond the he called you Yeah. Should we turn on? Should we turn? Yeah. Okay. So we're going to see if, if we can uh, summon art from the. Yeah, uh, <laughs> 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 it should be. Okay. 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 Uh, 
talks about some work that you might have done. <laughs> Where are you? I'm, uh, I'm actually in uh, Brookhaven, New York. I was scheduled to go and see Dick Hahn tomorrow morning, and that's what I'm doing, which uh, will be great. Everybody who knows Dick will be, and knows that he had a stroke a few years ago, will be very pleased that uh, it was he who told me uh, uh, that he's looking forward to seeing me and that his daughter is going to come and so on. He's worked very hard and got his speech back to the point that uh, uh, we could have a conversation on the phone when I was talking with him. It's, it's very heartwarming, so. Great, Dick had a, Dick had a stroke, had a unfortunately. Stroke. Yeah. So uh, you had a couple of talks, who was talking? Well, I was, <laughs> and, and Jeff, uh, Jeff Wilkes talked, and uh, uh, Nikolai Tolich started us off with uh, an introduction. Good. And Jason is here, and he can talk too. I know. <laughs> I know. <laughs> it's great. Well, it's nice to nice to share a celebration with you, and uh, particularly because it gives me an opportunity to to say thank you to everybody there who contributed so much to the success of Snow. This really was a a teamwork proposition, as you all know, and uh, uh, there's been an awful lot of things done. Uh, uh, I think back to Peter Doe, who was there at day one, and before, in some sense. So, uh, Peter, are you there? No, unfortunately, Peter couldn't be here today. Well, pass, pass it on to, to him for me. Sure, and Hamish, uh, your leadership was absolutely fantastic throughout the whole time. And uh, everything from the very start, when we were dealing with uh, pulling things together when you were at Los Alamos, and of course, the absolute tour de force with the NCDs that uh, gave us an a, a improvement in accuracy and a really clear other technique to be sure that we had the neutral current right. So, uh, can I clap? <laughs> It's a good thing I gave the same answer. So I... <laughs> that was your problem, you know, if it didn't. <laughs> so, well, I, I've, uh, th this Nobel Prize thing is, is like another dimension. Uh, this week has been absolutely unbelievable. And there's uh, invitations to go everywhere in the world all at the same time. <laughs> There's, uh, uh, I was
was on 12 hours straight on the on the phone and, and in front of TV cameras the first day, starting at 5 a.m. and uh, then it continued the next two. So I, I, I had to get out of town. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm going to Princeton uh, uh, in the afternoon tomorrow, actually, to do to talk with Cristiano about uh, depleted argon for uh, uh, future versions of. Uh, deep and other uh, dark matter detectors, but then I'm going to Carleton on Thursday and Deep River on Friday, uh, which I was going to do anyway because my uh, daughter's away and my, I was going up to babysit. But uh, we're going to have a little event at Carleton with Dave Sinclair and at Chalk River with Dave uh, Earl, and we'll, uh, we might have more than one Martinez. Hamish, what's that? <laughs> Have a few for me. <laughs> All right. All right. And say hi to the base for us, too. Will do. Will do. And uh, please uh, uh, pass on. I can't see who's in the room, but uh, uh, I uh, you turn it around. certainly. Yeah, why don't you do that? We'll turn, we'll turn you around. I'll try to do that without breaking this. Great. Yeah. Oh. Thanks, Jason. Let's see. Part oh, wow. <laughs> Know that. That's as far as it turns, sorry. <laughs> I thought we were having a little private uh, conversation. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you all for uh, for coming, and uh, I'll uh, uh, let you get back to uh, your uh, drinking. <laughs> All right, here we go. So, it's okay. Okay, I'm going to wrap it up uh, and try to take you from these uh, great discoveries and show you where they've uh, led us over the past 15 years or so, and uh, try to bring you up to speed on where we're headed now at the cutting edge of uh, neutrino research. So, uh, Nikolai told you about uh, a neutrino oscillation in terms of a, a two flavor uh, model. And actually, the original data were all uh, analyzed this way. It's uh, lucky we were able to actually do that. Uh, in reality, as you know, there's three neutrinos. We have to deal with the full three neutrino uh, uh, oscillations. This plot sort of uh, schematically shows uh, what's going on when you create an electron neutrino. The oscillation probability is a function of the distance divided by the energy that a neutrino has. Uh, and uh, and you can see that uh, if you ask what's the uh, what's the probability that you find the neutrino to still be an electron neutrino after traveling some distance uh, or distance divided by energy, then it has this this uh, double wiggle pattern. And the big this big oscillation here corresponds to the the delta of squared. The, the, sorry, I should say this frequency is determined by the mass difference between the mass uh, the neutrinos uh, involved in the oscillation. And, uh, and the amplitude is determined by this, uh, this mixing angle that you saw on uh, Jeff's slides. So the, yeah, this big oscillation pattern corresponds to the, the frequency uh, of this uh, solar neutrino flavor transformation. And the, the fast wiggle here uh, corresponds to the atmospheric oscillations. And we got three amplitudes to work with. Uh, uh, we have the amplitude here, the amplitude of this big one, and then the, the, there's only one more uh, uh, amplitude to work with and the uh, amplitude parameter to work with, and the, the, it's the uh, relative amplitude between these, these two uh, phases here. So in the subsequent years, we've uh, seen oscill neutrino oscillation in many different uh, shapes and forms. Uh, perhaps the most beautiful uh, uh, measurement of neutrino oscillation comes from the CAMLAN experiment that actually Nikolai and I uh, did our PhD thesis on. Uh, and uh, here we're looking at uh, neutri not neutrinos, but anti-electron neutrinos from nuclear reactors. And, uh, and this is that big wiggle corresponding to the solar neutrino <coughs> oscillations. And you see we see the, uh, we see the first minimum, this, the next maximum, the next minimum, another maximum, and hints of, the, of it going back down. And this, uh, this is just such a beautiful pattern. It uh, goes exactly uh, as uh, predicted by oscillations. And uh, since then, you, know, you can move your detector much closer to a reactor and look at this fast wiggle 
uh, and, and measure its fine amplitude. That was done by the Dia Bay uh, collaboration most recently. And the, uh, these uh, neutrino beam experiments, they've looked at a, a muon neutrino beam and looked at the, uh, uh, also the disappearance as well as the appearance of various neutrino flavors in that beam. It all hangs together really nicely. And if you put all the data together, it looks like a glorious mess. <laughs> So this is a, uh, a plot produced by Hitoshi Moriyama at Berkeley. It plots basically delta m squared, which is the frequency of these oscillations, versus uh, uh, these mixing angles, which give you the, those amplitudes. And uh, now we have three masses, so we have two frequencies, right? Here's the two frequencies, and let me, let me point these out to you. Here, this little dot here is that Diabe experiment. This dot here is Super K, uh, Jeff's experiment, and these beam experiments. And here's the snow result and the cam line result where they agree. Here's our three little islands. And you see we have two frequencies and we have three mixing angles, OK? And if you, uh, now the, these, uh, these frequencies, they give us the mass differences between the, the neutrinos. And we know that uh, from the solar delta m squared, we know actually that mass 2, the one that we call mass 2, is heavier than mass 1. And now from atmospheric neutrinos, though, we, we know that there's uh, some difference between mass 3 and the other two, but we don't know if mass 3 is heavier or actually lighter than the other two. And if, uh, in, the, in the field, we call this the normal and the inverted hierarchy. And the other thing we don't know is what's the absolute scale of this lightest neutrino, whether it's mass 1 or mass 2. That mass scale has a lot of uh, uh, consequences. Uh, and uh, some of the bigger ones, bigger ones are cosmological. So the Big Bang predicts that uh, uh, we're just bathing in a universe filled with neutrinos. There's several hundred neutrinos for every cubic centimeter just floating through all of us right now. And uh, that makes them the second most ubiquitous particle in the universe behind the photon. Uh, despite their ubiquity, though, they don't make up much of the matter uh, density, the, 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 the matter budget of the universe. In fact, they can't be the dark matter, although people were excited that maybe they could be early on. Um, uh, but they do exp uh, affect the expansion rate of the universe and uh, the, um, uh, the smoothness of structure. And uh, so, for example, some of the best cosmological limits come from looking at the cosmic microwave background radiation. You see the, this is a, sort of a, pitch, a picture of the light coming from the, uh, essentially the Big Bang, but actually much after it. And you see these patches of, of hot and dark, uh, hot and cold regions, although those are actually very small fluctuations in temperature of the cosmic microwave background. And the presence of neutrino mass would make the hot spots hard, hotter and the cold spots colder. And so we know that the neutrinos can't get much heavier than, uh, than a, a fraction of an electron volt. This is a million times, more than a million times lighter than the electron uh, before we start disagreeing with this data. Now, a problem with this, these limits is that they're very model dependent. Uh, and uh, tying all these cosmological data sets together is, is fraught with all sorts of systematic uncertainties and, and things are really um, hard to pin down. And so what we'd really like to do is get a really uh, a uh, good measure of the neutrino mass, an absolute measure of the neutrino mass. And for this, the best technique known is to go back to the original beta decay, decay spectrum where we, uh, uh, where we first, uh, that first clued us into the existence of the neutrino. And you take, say, for example, a huge mass of tritium, and you, and you get a giant spectrometer to measure these uh, electron energies. And you look for the electrons with the highest energy. And you try to look for uh, how close they get to the available energy, this transition energy. And when, and when they stop short, that distance by which they stop short tells you how much mass, uh, how much energy was required to create the mass of the neutrino using uh, Einstein's E equals mc squared. OK, so we have some old experiments from the uh, from 90s and early 2000s, Troitsk and Mainz, Troitsk and Mainz that set this limit on the mass of the neutrino. And the Katrin experiment, which is uh, which Hamish leads now, uh, he's the U.S. Uh, spokesperson, uh, uses uh, it, it takes this uh, technique to its limit using the largest spectrometer we can build. It's the size of like a four-bedroom house in Karlsruhe, Germany, <laughs> and uh, that's about as good as we're going to do on this technique. It gets us down another order of magnitude, right where the cosmological limits are uh, are starting to press against. Uh, and to go beyond this, we need a new technique. Uh, luckily, these guys have a new idea. That's to try to measure the beta energies, the electron energies, in a new way 
by putting them in a magnetic field, and as they rotate around helically, they emit a radiation with frequency uh, that is uh, determined by the electron energy. They can measure that very uh, precisely, and we built uh, this device. It is actually downstairs, uh, just underground, about over that way. And uh, it's already working. It's uh, rapidly improving in sensitivity, and we're uh, really excitedly watching, uh, see, seeing how far we can push this uh, technique. Okay, uh, I'm about out of time, so I'll, I'll kind of go quickly over this. But the last thing uh, uh, I really want to talk about is the difficulty in incorporating the neutrino mass into the standard model. Uh, it seems pretty straightforward, just add a, uh, you know, just give the particle a mass. But the neutrino masses are really special. The neutrino masses are many orders of magnitude below the other standard model particles, and uh, this mixing that they have, right? This this is a pictorial representation of the mixing matrix. It says that, for example, the electron neutrino is mostly uh, nu1 and nu2 with a small admixture of nu3. If you look at the uh, similar mixing uh, uh, matrix for the quarks, you see a largely diagonal structure with, with these small mixing angles. Whereas in the neutrino case, we have these very large mixing angles. It's, it was really quite a surprise. And it seems pretty clear that something special is going on with the neutrino masses, and likely they're being generated in a, in a way that's very different from all the other fundamental particles in a standard model. Now there's uh, uh, some hints from grand unified theories, or some sort of naturality arguments, and uh, uh, generic predictions that maybe the neutrino has this uh, heavy big sister, uh, uh, which I call capital N, and that, that heavy particle couples to the, to the neutrino via the Higgs interaction that gives all the other standard model particles their mass. And that interaction drives the neutrino to be very, uh, very light compared to the other standard model particles. That same uh, heavy particle would be produced in the early universe and would decay to standard model leptons and antileptons. And if you have CP violation, uh, then that, that would imply that one of these might occur more often than, other one, than the other one. And if, for example, if it decays more often into matter than antimatter, it might solve a big problem for us, which is why we exist at all. The standard model treats uh, matter and antimatter symmetrically, and if everything was perfectly symmetric, uh, you know, in the Big Bang, we'd create all sorts of matter and antimatter. The antimatter and matter would all annihilate with each other, and we wouldn't be here. So somehow we ended up with a matter-dominated universe. The neutrino could be uh, uh, the reason why. Uh, but it requires that the neutrino has a special particle that it's its own antiparticle. So Nikolai showed you this picture in the beginning where we have left-handed neutrinos and we have right-handed antineutrinos, and the right-handed neutrino and left-handed antineutrino just don't ha haven't been observed in nature. Well, it might very well be that the left that the right-handed neutrino is the antineutrino, and we want to set up to determine that. And we also want to see and look if we can get enough CP violation from neutrinos to make these models viable. And so, uh, yeah, I think in lieu of time, I won't say much about it. Uh, we have these uh, experiments. The only known measure method for looking for uh, this property of the neutrino is double beta decay, where you look for these nuclei where you have two beta decays occurring simultaneously, and the neutrinos ha essentially annihilate each other, which they can only do if they have, to have this property, before they ever leave the nucleus. And the two electrons carry away all of the energy, and you get this little peak at the end of the beta decay spectrum corresponding to that full energy. And there's a large number of experiments aiming to do this, including the one that I'm on. And the snow, the snow experiment actually is being refurbished into a double beta decay detector. They're, they've converted it from a heavy water detector into a, li uh, a liquid scintillator detector loaded with one of these nuclei. And on the uh, uh, charge part, uh, uh, the CP violation side, uh, here we're taking these uh, long, um, neutrino beams, for example, a neutrino beam from Fermi Lab aimed at the Homestake mine where Ray Davis did this experiment that first elucidated the solar neutrino problem. Super Kamio Kande uh, is uh, uh, being proposed to be upgraded. Actually, they're going to build a new detector further away uh, called Hyper Kamio Kande, which is another 20 times bigger. Is it 20 times bigger? Yeah, I don't know what. What prefix will use next? Though. It's I, yeah. <laughs> after hyper, I think it's Uru Toda. Uru Toda Anyway, uh, yeah. So, and the, the goal here is to look very precisely at the oscillation pattern of neutrinos versus antineutrinos. And if you see some difference, that's the signature of uh, CP violation. 
And for the experts in the audience, there's some hints already, actually from the existing long baseline neutrino uh, beams, T2K and NOVA, plus some uh, for the, that Dia Bay reactor experiment. You put all the data together, and you get a one and a half sigma sort of uh, uh, preference for CP, maximal CP violation of minus pi over two, uh, with uh, some preference for the uh, weak preference for the normal hierarchy, hierarchy over the inverted hierarchy. Okay, so I think I'll leave it there. Uh, the special feature was actually the call art. And uh, but now I'll uh, invite Hamish up uh, for a final word. There were a lot of people who worked on, on snow, and a lot of them uh, were quite local. And I just wanted to, uh, I actually sent out an invitation to everybody I thought might be able to make it to Vancouver. You know, I don't know if people came here from that far, but uh, this is a list of the more than 30 people uh, that worked on, on snow who were from UW. The, uh, the ones in, in blue are students, uh, many of whom are now holding faculty positions and staff positions in national labs around, uh, around the US and elsewhere. So I would just like to ask if uh, everybody on snow would please stand up. I think we'll talk about All right, and now I think it's time for some refreshments. <laughs> <laughs>